chat with Nicholas. He'll listen to you. Then he'll laugh, and then he'll cry with you. It's all in a safe space for you to speak your truth. Oh, come and chat with Nick. Hi, everyone. I'm super excited to have Maximilian Gucci with us today. Uh, Max, where are you based at the moment? I'm in Mainz in central Germany. So Max is the founder of Unifier.ai, and we're going to talk a little bit about generative AI. So these are terms that you might have heard of and should become accustomed with. And when we talk about generative AI, we're thinking about things like mid-journey, we're thinking about things like ChatGPT, Dali, and things like that. But there are a whole bunch of products and services that are being developed on the back of these AI technologies that very smart and young entrepreneurs like Max are taking advantage of and bringing these to the market first. So I really want to talk about what are the potentials for you as an entrepreneur to start thinking about what brilliant idea can I build off all of these new AI platforms there are? What are some of the challenges? What, how do you brainstorm? How do you defend yourself against the 500 other startups that are trying to do the same thing? So we're going to talk about that. And obviously, with all of these generative AI startups, they're all new, except Dali and um, Midjourney, which have been going on for about a year or so. So it's a lifetime in AI, but in human terms, quite short. So Max, great having you on board. Maybe just give us a little bit of the background in terms of who are you? Is it the difficult and hard philosophic question at the beginning? But I would always define myself as kind of like this product guy that designs products, does the product management, is involved in also partnerships and sales, but not ne necessarily technical. So the, the thing was like, I, I had always had these tons of startup ideas in my head. And at one point I was just, I wanted to get them out. And I realized one thing that's really difficult is like finding a good co-founder, technical co-founder and I met a lot of people who they thought they were going to walk around with their brilliant ideas and, oh, yeah, so smart. I'm going to be the next Mark Zuckerberg. And no, no programmers ever was ever interested in them. So I was like, on the mission, how can I be the best business co-founder that can, that is not able to code possible? So I did everything. Business strategy books. I taught myself UX design because that's like how I visualize the ideas, go and fix my design them figure them out there, user research techniques, and went really deep into different analytics, growth metrics, and this kind of stuff. So bringing everything together that you can bring to a technical call phone and says like, hey, us two, we're going to be an amazing team. Because I, I, I studied, you know, sociology and politics after I couldn't figure out computer science. So really I think I did, did 15 Udemy courses and whatever. So really like trying to be that product business, self-taught guy, really. That's, that's me in, the, in essence, I would say. Well, I think there's some other parallels in the tech world, such as Steve Jobs and Wozniak. So Steve Jobs wasn't exactly sitting there in a dark cupboard coding all day. He did obviously have an understanding. And I think that's like you say, with the Udemy courses and having at least a structural understanding of the industry. But you come with a, a very different viewpoint into AI which I, and I've been working on for the last couple of years, something called creative data science, which is we've got all of these smart folks out there who are technical and can write Python code and Ruby and all of these exciting things, but don't know how to bring a, a product to market. Don't know how to come up with a, an idea that actually might excite, excite, the, excite the market. So why don't we talk a little bit about unifier.ai and our leave a link in the podcast notes so that people can go and try, have a free trial and see exactly what's going on. Because I, I had a look before this podcast and what it does is exactly what I want. So maybe talk us through what the product is and then we can start talking a bit about how did you come up with this idea out of the thousands of potential ideas you could have had on generative AI. Yeah, so just... A note or like a, a note before all of that. So me and my technical co-founder, we met at Y Combinator online startup school like five or six years ago and became friends. And we tried out all kinds of different products, products we couldn't build, products that we built it and 
they will come kind of like strategy never worked also we have a bunch of like failed products and ruined projects in our belt and this time really we both like he tried his own little sass i i was in a community of like crypto people uh trying to build this and so it really this time it was the first time i built a product that came out of my own issue because like I'm very good at LinkedIn and these social media and posting there, but I was always like, it, it became a chore for me, right? It's like, it, you have to come up with original content all the time, do these online events and webinars. And I had already so much content and I thought like when ChatGPT came up, I was like, man, we got to do something with this. Like it's such a big problem. There's millions of hours of content already created out there. Can, can we, can we not just transcribe it and put it into new posts, into blog posts. How can I scale myself on all these platforms at the same time um, and be present there with my own unique voice? So I tried out chat GPT and if I'm like a lifestyle influencer, super cool for me because now I could create a generic robotic content that scale, but it, that's not me. Like I'm, I like to talk about tokenomics and, and product management and analytics and it comes really deep and it never really worked for me. So we built this tool based on that problem and then started and it continues. And now it really, you ask how it works. You upload a YouTube video that can quite take a while because YouTube doesn't want people to download their YouTube videos. So that sometimes can take a while, but yeah, you just insert a link, you get the blog posts and the, the, the LinkedIn posts automatically written. So it's transcribed, put through AI. Now a fairly complex system of little AI prompts and agents that structure it, restructure it, edit it, and then you get the final product out and you just sit in front of it. And that's really how it works now. So it's basically a time-saving tool. So for example, with my, if I had to look at my podcast, so we'll, we'll do this podcast, instead of me having to listen or transcribe it myself, have a look at, okay, which are the, the best sections for me to, to use for a short, for a short Twitter post, Instagram post, not Instagram post, but LinkedIn post blog. It will already take the content that we've been speaking about. So it's not AI generated in terms of generic content. It is the content that we're talking about here. So I yeah. think that's, that's a very useful function. I just want to go back one step. First of all, some folks have asked me to explain some jargon that we use. So I want to talk about two things. One is about SaaS or SaaS and the second I. I'm just going to explain SaaS quickly, which is software as a service. And basically, this is something where you're paying a monthly or per use, per use for, a, for, a, for a software, such as accounting software. And it's all, on, it's all online. So you're paying for the, the software as a service. When it comes to generative AI, can you explain a little bit about what is generative AI? Um, yeah, so usually generative AI for most of people is associated with large language models, with, the, with it are basically these huge AI models that mathematically determine if I tell it to do something, it can say like, okay, it's very likely. So it's, it's, it's all ma mainly based on statistical possibilities. It can, like, I can ask it for, I don't know, a blog post and it will know based on frequency it, it read and based on what it has in the model that what, a, how a blog post look and can then generate it. So really generative AI is any artificial intelligence that I can use to generate something out of data, out of prompt, out of an input, out of an interaction and that usually create something new because like TikTok also reacts to you through machine learning. So it curates something for you. Generative AI is really like it generates a new output based on the input it gets. That's the simplest form, I would say. Yeah. And this goes to video, audio, text, text a, whole a whole bunch images, of images. So yeah. It's growing yeah. the whole time. Now, we're talking about AI and machine learning and generative AI, but one of the things you mentioned slightly earlier was going to the Y Combinator. And something people forget about AI and machine learning and all of these great tools is that we still need human interaction. The way that you've built your business is by networking. So perhaps talk to me about the importance of networking, not just with things like Y Combinator, but for you as an entrepreneur, how important is networking for you? And how often do you do, you do networking? 
I mean, it's, I've, uh, it's the most important thing you can do. Like every single thing. So I, I, I was only seven months employed total. Got fired from my first job after two months. After my second job, after six months, I was like, can't, can't do this ever again. Like I would rather live in the mountains in a communist commune or whatever. And I, I basically went on LinkedIn and just started posting about the platform business models about, or like at that time, probably more like product management and product design. So really like if you just sit at home, nothing's going to happen. So. I go, go to conferences often. I DM a ton of people on LinkedIn every week. I'm like, Hey, I just saw that post, man. Interesting. Bob, I, I would say it's, it's, it's like, I always want to say like, it's not luck. It's engineering ser serendipity a bit. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm planting little seeds. For example, why I'm a podcast host on your podcast. I have no idea what's going to come out of this, but people's going to, going to hear me. Maybe, maybe you, we, we do business. Together, maybe one of your listeners going to hear that and say like, Hey, this is amazing. I need this for my enterprise. And it's just to be visible and I'll, I'll, I'll be, I'll, I'm on podcasts on LinkedIn. I will at some point go on Twitter once my tool allows me to. So there's a lot of different ways where yeah, I network. I, I think the, the networking side, especially as an entrepreneur, that quite a large part of your job is building networks and building relationships. And as you mentioned. Who knows where the next big thing or the next big contact or value add to your business is going, is going to come through. It could be, as you mentioned, one of the listeners from the show. Max, talk to me about how, again, you decided on the AI versus 20 other, 20 other options. Cause you've said, and it's, it's interesting that you mentioned you had a couple of false starts in the beginning with other technologies. When chat GPT came out about a year or so ago. Talk to me about your process of deciding to go with unify.ai and then perhaps the, the process of building the product. Yeah, so absolutely. I, I was in the middle of doing like an online course for a community on uh, how to analyze tokens and are they any valuable? How can you figure out if a token economy is not valuable in the long term? And we had like nine recordings. There were VCs from like the crypto space. There were people from other token designers, investors, and I had nine recordings there. And I was like, if I can, what was this? I, I, I would love to have this. I tried to write an, I remember I tried writing an medium article. I never finished because I then now I switched to a business, but it took me such an insane amount of time, like 30 hours. And it's, it's one of my talks basically put into like a text format and it's, it was so painful to do it that we were, that I was like, once we tried it out and we played around a bit with like chat GPT and just simply posting a transcript or something inside, we realized, okay, there is something here. And the good thing, I'm, I'm more like that classical German sits there as a bit pessimistic about technology and the world and looks at this and says like, yeah, I don't think that's going to work. But my co-founder is like. I don't know, like he's this crazy optimist. He's from Morocco. So I think people maybe in North Africa are just, they're just more happy and more optimistic. I don't know. But he was like, now we're going to make this work. And then we iterated. And it's like, I was like, hey, give me LinkedIn posts. And the LinkedIn posts were shit. And, it, then, and then people started writing blog posts out of stuff. And then we just implemented it. And then we had 700 blog, uh, blog posts. And then that was like on like 700 words blog posts, which is not a, a lot, but Long story short, once we kind of figured out how it works, we then reached out to a couple of people and said, like, is that interesting? And one of the first, first bigger clients was the Network Summit. They ran 51 conference talks through our stuff so they can write a digital report out of it. And that was really like, hey, if, that, if there's one conference that's going to do it, there's a bunch of others. And so really, we start building it, putting it on the website. And our first paid client that was like in July, just came through LinkedIn and just on the website, my, my profile is optimized for that kind of funnel, went on there, uploaded, and I know him. So we started chatting, feedback back and forth. And then they just paid and he paid a business subscription straight, 70 bucks a month. And I was like, holy shit. I was like, damn. Okay. That's, that's really something. And now really 
one of the biggest things is that prompt engineering part at the moment, because like obviously front end is not a big deal and really getting, getting all the, the prompts to work in a way to really structure the post nicely that the context and the information makes sense took us a long time. Yeah. But now Max, you're going into completely uncharted waters almost because with generative AI and these services that you are providing, you don't necessarily have that many competitors or that many other examples to copy from. You are basically creating a brand new product. So like when electricity was first invented, people just used a light bulb, but now we're using electricity for a multitude of things and people can copy a whole, a whole bunch of things. Where do you get your ideas? How do you decide what features to keep, what features to drop? How much research do you do? Do you have any companies that you look to for how you create new products or new services on, on Unifier? Yeah, so I'm really an information addict to the core. I get 15 AI's newsletter a day with tools and recommendations. So I, I know everything. I know I, like, it, it's very hard for me to miss one of these. I look at them. Looked at their onboarding. I also got a lot of inspiration from Nose and Airtables, the big ones that really figured out onboardings and stuff and making it nicer and these kind of things. So really like I, and, and a lot of things where a lot of the design patterns I have there are just copied, meshed together so that they work for my purpose. So I look to companies in the, in the content space, Canva, for example, how they structure their dashboard. Uh, yeah, and other tools. So it's really like, also my design work is not, I, I, I don't try to reinvent the wheel. I try to get like an easy navigation out and then and use the, use the moving elements around. And then I also look at other AI company, what they are doing, how automated are there? Is there user interactive interactivity as well? Because like grading everything automated can be quite difficult with not, not having a user to say like, Hey, this is a blog post. I want this kind of outline. So yeah, it got a lot of research. Yeah, I do, I do a half an hour research a day at least. And then I skim read through all these newsletters and try all the tools out that I find it. I uh, spoke to a very interesting chap yesterday. Who's got a, an app called brain bump. And I'm going to share that. I'll share that link with you. He's, he's fantastic. Mark Hirschberg. He's a, a lecturer, he does lecturing at MIT and in career development and, and things like that. And especially, he's also a product manager. So I'm definitely going to introduce you. I'm sure the two of you would, would get on quite, would get on quite nicely. What does success look like you for this? What sort of roadmap have you given yourself? Have you said 10 paying customers by the end of this month, a hundred, a thousand, and how are you looking at scaling this? Do you think this is a business that can scale or do you think this is a entry into learning the industry and building a completely new product at some stage? So I think, yeah, I, I think it's absolutely scalable. So what I realize now, and this is, this is weird. Like we have, we have a bunch of customers almost at 10 now and none of them are similar. Like. Two of them have similar job roles, but every single one of these customers has a different use case for Unifier. So it's obviously designed for just taking any content and putting reformatting, but there's an SFB now that does agile development, a hundred, a hundred people. So there's a podcaster that is a fractional CMO. There is that agile, that agile company that is private university where, where like one of our coaches had, or like one of, one of the coaches, they had like this, this huge, long 15, uh, sessions, session recording for like an online executive course with education. There was this con there's a conference. So like, I can't really pin it down, but it's definitely scalable. And the market is in Spain. I'd right? like, if you just look at S and content marketing team, it's huge. It's insanely huge. And coaches and LinkedIn creators, there's 4 million active LinkedIn creators. I just need 2,000 of them or 3,000 and it's going to work. So really the focus would be get the scalable. We, we are working a lot on quality. So our next iteration is going to be so much better than the, the last one. Like it's going to be insanely 
precise at context and also using really good templates and frameworks. So one vision I have is that I want to call it this unique content scaling platform, but takes unique content, but then also puts it into the best templates creator have. And also we have a little AI agent that is trained on hook, so it can also write the best hooks immediately into this content. So it's not just taking your content, but also enhancing it so that you don't have to do it anymore. That's really like the vision. And this is where we executing against. And yeah, I don't think I will want to build another business besides that. It's just sales is obviously sales, branding, positioning. It's very interesting story. Yeah. So you're going through a very interesting process now of trying to scale a business that has potential. You've got very few staff, I take it. It's you and your, and your co-founder and possibly some, some, some other coders. You now need to, as you mentioned, build your brand. You need to build awareness. You've got the channel. So you, or this transcript of this podcast, for example, could be used and used as uh, additional marketing. You've got 10 customers. Tell me how you're going to get to 100 customers and then to 10,000 customers. Because the, and I'm going to challenge you a little bit here because I would like to see if you thought about it or yeah. if you need some guidance so we can get some of our, our listeners perhaps to help you build the business because that's yeah. the whole point of this podcast is to make people better off than when they, when they join. So what is your process of taking it from 10 paying customers, which is amazing, I mean, that people are paying for it means that it's, it's got potential. But tell me about your scaling. 10 people are not going to pay the bills. 100 people are not going to pay the bills. And these are the challenges that other startups are going to be dealing with. They might have a product that, how are you going to scale it? Are you going to get outside investment? Are you going to self-fund it? Talk to me through your, if you don't mind, talk, talk me through That's your so process of how you're going to get to 1,000 subscribers. Because I guess that is a, a number that you've got in mind. And when, and how can we help you get to that thousand subscribers or, or give you insights and information to get you there? So one thing I'm fairly big on is also partnerships. So one thing, and I think that's also really cool for us is just, we, we, we are developing services together with agencies, with ghostwriters, with other people that can amplify this. So really the goal would be. Unifier enabled something like this conference, taking 51 conference talks, or you can't really offer that as a service to repurpose that because either you do it manually, yeah, or you do it manually and you have to charge 10K for it or 15K because you need an, an, an entire army of people. So now developing these unique services with people that can also offer this is a huge thing because it's like we are taking the uniqueness of some agencies, the freelancers, merging them together into high value consulting proposals, and then having them out. Because like Notion is a crazy example. They grew through their community to billions. They never really burned much on ads. They never really burned much on like invested much in, in SEO because like, well, what do you want to rank for content knowledge management or content management system? Doesn't really work, right? So. I would say the first thousand could be just through that, through the partnerships, strategic partnerships, agencies, and so on. And we already have some really good ones that have a huge reach. Well, I, I love that idea about the conferences, because I can imagine that it's, as you said, one of the challenges that these conferences have is tons of great speakers. I, for example, can't go to every one of these stages and listen to everyone I want to. And if I could get the summary or a blog or an outline of these talks, it would be tremendously valuable. If, if you had to ask my humble opinion, my focus would be on the conference scene and become, that could be your Big Mac, your, your, your main product that you sell. And I think that the potential of that is tremendous, as you mentioned. How many conferences are there around in the world? This is something where you can link with something like Eventbrite. So have it as a, a partnership with Eventbrite where you get a free trial, et cetera, or 30 minutes subscription free and, and focus on one particular area versus trying to go after the entire market, which is a mistake that some entrepreneurs do. They, they see the market, this enormous market, but let yeah. us really just focus in, in one particular area. So 
as, as my, my, my two cents worth would be, if it's working on the conference circuit, you've got a great example there, go ahead. And then what's the next logical step from that? Universities, business schools, et cetera. So some, some really good, good potential there. So we're trying to get network effect. So you're going to be network, networking with folk, the folks, and you want to try and do this more organically versus getting outside investment. When do you think you would look at outside investment or is that something that you're going to try and avoid for as long as possible? So the good thing is like, I also do my freelancing just on the side on product and innovation, so that gets money inside and I say our subscriptions are not on the cheap side. So if I get a hundred clients, I'm solved. I can feed me, I can feed, yeah, my co-founder, not more or less. So that should be, that should be already like a, the, the start of like, I'm not going to be rich, but it's, it's going to pay the bill efficiently, I would say. So yeah, maybe not sufficiently, but you know, the, 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 this would be the goal. And so getting the next thousand two partnerships, the conferences could be possible. Yeah. But that, like I would, my next step could be getting again more into cold outreach that worked like semi, semi well in the past, but you know, that is some that's on the table. I need to introduce you to some Americans because they would say a hundred, those are rookie numbers. So we need to have a look at how we can get you out to a, to a, to a larger audience. You're talking about making iterations and changes to your product. Sometimes products over-engineer themselves. If you look at ChatGPT, it's a very simple function and a very simple inter interface. Are you a perfectionist? Do you want to get the product out into market and adapt it as it goes? Or when do you think your product is going to be good enough to get this expansion that you're looking for? Do you, do you think about that? What is your process? Uh, so the product really should be good enough for my standards. So I'm definitely a perfectionist here. And I try to design the product in a way that is extremely simple to use. It takes away prompt engineering from the user. I don't necessarily want to have a chat bot or anything there that really takes, takes time from users. And that's why the first user, when the product was terrible or like the content output, that's what still make them pay quite substantial amounts of money. So that is a thing, but really for the main expansion, I think we're looking at one, two weeks, three weeks, because like now we've really built a system that is, that is much better, works much better with the AI. The content is quality is really like probably 10, 20 X better than the current version. And like we, we, I, and one of our co-founders or growth advisors, we have 30,000 combined LinkedIn followers. So once we get really active on that, we should at least get a hundred or 200 more into this. And then, then we can re, re evaluate the map. see, is there something, are people retaining better? Are they referring more people? Yeah. At the moment, it's still like pushing a fold out the hill. What's keeping you up at night, Max? Oh, a lot of things. I mean. The opportunity as well, I was like, I'm, I'm so excited at the moment that it's difficult for me to end the day. Um, usually my girlfriend just comes home and says like, attention is on me. And I'm like, good. Yeah. But it's like, I, I, w I wake up 7am in the morning, look at my phone and I'm like, yes, I have enough day. But really it's to, it's the excitement of the opportunity. It's really cool. I work with incredibly smart people. So like, I have a lot of things I would like to improve and worries, but the good thing is the market is so enormous. Even if I complete fucking up and I end up with 10,000 people, I could probably still slip it for 30 million or something. So that's, that's, that's what keeps me sane at the moment. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's the exciting phase is when you wake up in the morning going, yes, so I, I I've had that feeling. How do you think you're going to keep yourself motivated once you've got 10,000 people? Are you going to relax on your on your yacht or are you going to, have you thought about once this is a, imagine it, this is a wonderful success. What is your next phase in life? So imagine unifier.ai becomes the next chat GPT 
the next LinkedIn was used, utilized by tens of thousands of people on LinkedIn and you've got boatloads of money. Are you going to go to space? Are you going to create uh, your own electric car? What is What would the, your next logical step be? Yeah, it would probably be another business. I just have lists of ideas, especially once you go into language model, you understand what's possible and what's not. And then you work on problems. It's just like, like I, I have a list. It's, it's just growing. I have like a, a couple of favorite ideas, but one thing I would probably do and it too. Now it's not weird, it's quite cool, but I, I would sit down with my dad and I would interview him and he had like, he's a phot photographer and he went to India with my mom in the eighties and to China when it opened one year after it opened up. So like I would digitalize all these images, interview him and then try to find someone that's really good Dali or something and create like this video formats of interactive storylines that kind of like preserve the memory of my, of my family. I think that would be an amazing thing to do. Yeah. So you're going to be busy for a long time. I take it. One of the questions you listed as potential questions was what is the worst hype innovation of the last couple of years? What have, what have been new technologies? Let's just imagine ChatGPT was a dud. What other technologies do you think have, have, have come onto the market, but have completely just, uh, failed? Mm. I mean, like the matter was, I think was pretty much the dumbest idea ever because like chat TPT and generative AI might be overhyped, but it works in some way. The matter was, was just an imaginative bubble, right? So it's, it doesn't exist and right? it's, it's not there. So I was like, why on earth would now Siemens hire a chief metaverse officer? What the actual fuck? Like that was insane. And I was always like, no, no, this is not going to happen. And then even Facebook with $15 billion, they fucked it up and it didn't work. And I was like, how crazy is this? There's like consultants running on LinkedIn that want to sell you a metaverse strategy. How do you need a strategy for something that doesn't exist? I was like, holy sh Yeah, don't want to swear too much. I don't know if there's, if Google flex it or something. No, <laughs> I'll just. I'll just beep, beep it out or I'll put a, a thumbs up sign, <laughs> sign next to it. I, I also thought met the metaverse was a, a giant waste of time. And obviously Facebook think that as well, because they fired or let go half or three quarters of the people working on the metaverse. But, uh, I don't know if you ever listened to Lex Friedman. He did a interesting podcast with, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, where they had, they'd they would taken it from the metaverse where you look like a Lego character to one where it is your actual avatar. So I okay. think perhaps Facebook and the metaverse just jumped the gun. They hadn't really understood the, the real potential or how people in, want to interact with this augmented reality or virtual reality space. But I can see in our, at our own university, we're starting to look at interactive learning through using augmented reality and virtual reality, but I think it's still got a long way to go. The technology and the headsets and that, and the trying to move your hands. And it's, it's like trying to conduct an orchestra or do a surgery, but we don't have the skills and, and technology yet. I think perhaps in 10 years time, when this current generation of kids who've been on mobile phones and uh, tablets, uh, 24 hours a day, they might be ready for it, but. I think yeah. it's perhaps started a little bit, a little bit too earlier, a little bit too early. I'm not going to go into crypto and tokenomics. That's a completely different discussion, but I, I'm very excited to see what your, your growth and your progress is going to be. And again, if I could just make one or two suggestions that I think would be helpful for you, helpful for you is to set very clear timelines on when you're going to hit hit certain targets. So if you haven't reached 20 by next week in terms of new subscribers, what are you doing wrong? If you haven't reached a hundred by X and it will right. scale and it will, it will increase, increase by that. And I'll obviously try and share the platform with, with other folks because it's exactly what podcasters like myself need because we also are running the ship by ourselves. So it's definitely addressing a need. It's definitely simple enough. The, the design, et cetera, is, is good. 
I think we can work on the branding. That's my background. So I'm happy to sit with you and, and go through some, some branding tips and tricks because since you're starting bootstrapping this yourself, networks are very important. And I'm sure if anyone else is interested in helping you build this and expand this into the market, they should get in touch with you. So where can folks get in touch with you, Max? Mainly LinkedIn at the moment. That's the easiest. I'll share that link and folks can get in touch with you. Max, thank you so much for your time. It's been really interesting chatting to you and about your process. And I look forward to chatting to you again in a couple of months and seeing your progress and what version two looks like. And if you've added any interesting new features that are going to challenge the market. All right. Let's, let's see it. I will, I will, I will definitely, yeah, definitely set. I would say set stricter goals is a, is a really good one because like, as you said, the over-engineering is very easy to do. Absolutely. Mm, come chat with Nicholas. He'll listen to you. Then he'll laugh and then he'll cry with you. It's all in a safe space for you to speak your truth. Oh.